Water and fire. These are normally seen as opposites. But what if I told you not exactly? What if I told you that all you needed to do is to unburn the water? Now wait, 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 hold up. How is that possible? Well, we know that water is made through the combustion of hydrogen and oxygen. We also know this releases a lot of energy. Therefore, it creates the very stable water compound that we all know and love. However, the key here is you can actually reverse that reaction and give its energy back using electricity. In essence, unburning the water. This is what is known as electrolysis. Now, electrolysis is magic, but it is a magic we understand. <laughs> Just like how in chemistry you can mix chemicals and heat or stir to initiate most reactions, electrolysis is doing the exact same thing but using electrons as the chemical you mix in and the heating slash stirring is the voltage that you apply. To set this up, we need water, a power supply, two electrodes, and something ionic to dissolve in water in order to make it conductive, like table salt. Now let's see what this looks like in reality. As we slowly turn up the voltage, initially nothing happens. This is because we aren't providing enough energy or potential to initiate the reaction of electrons with water. Keep in mind that this solution is conductive, so electrons are still flowing, just not with enough energy to do anything. But when the voltage gets high enough, we hit the decomposition voltage. This is when we finally have enough energy to force the water to start reacting with our electrons. At this point, you can turn up the voltage to allow a lot more current to pass through, and you can see a much larger generation of hydrogen and oxygen. Now, let's go over physically what's happening here. First, we'll look at the anode. This is essentially acting as a large vacuum cleaner for electrons, sucking up the electrons with the force of suck that you see on the power supply. That's the voltage. At the decomposition voltage, this suck has enough energy to pull the electrons away from the oxygen in the water, more so than the hydrogen were previously. This causes the hydrogen to lose their electrons and become H plus ions while oxygen gives their electrons away and clings to the surface of the anode to become oxygen gas. On the opposite end, at the cathode, naturally the exact opposite is happening. Over here, there's a surplus of electrons being forced out, again at the force of the voltage shown on the power supply. The presence of this excess negative charge potential attracts those H plus ions that formed over at the anode and they quickly drift over, eating up those extra electrons, forming hydrogen gas at the surface of the cathode. Now naturally, it is a lot more complicated than this with many nuances, but for this video, that covers the basics of what you need to understand. So now that you are micro experts in electrolysis, how exactly does this apply to a PEM electrolyzer? PEM electrolyzer does the exact same thing that I just showed with my setup, but it does it a lot more efficiently. So I think that the best way to break this down is to pretend to make one. PEM stands for proton exchange membrane. This is literally just a sheet of plastic that lets only hydrogen ions pass through it. That is what this entire technology is built around. So let's take my cell from before, but this time let's put this PEM membrane in between the cathode and the anode. This now allows us to physically separate the oxygen from the hydrogen side, but it still lets the current pass through it in the form of the hydrogen ions. But we still have this pesky electrolyte. This is corrosive and decreases the purity of our gases because of side reactions. So let's just remove it. However, now that it's gone, there's nothing to conduct the electricity through the water. This also isn't a problem though, because we have this sheet of plastic that's conductive to the hydrogen ions, which is what we want anyways to be conducting. So let's just move the cathode and anode plate to be touching the membrane. Hmm. Now the membrane can't touch water, which is what we need to pass through it. So therefore it can't transfer any of the hydrogen ions. Again though, this isn't a problem. All we need to do is add some holes into our anode and cathode plates. Now the water can touch everything. This is looking almost finished. However, there is still one problem. Water touching both of the sides is a little bit redundant and causes potential for the uh, oxygen and hydrogen to mix because of some engineering constraints. However, we already have fake conductive water connecting the two plates. So realistically, we only need water on one side. In this case, it would have to be the anode since that's where the hydrogen ions form and they'll be able to cross over to the other side selectively. So here it is, a rudimentary PEM electrolyzer.
Now, all we need to do is put this into the magic box of cheap Chinese technologies that I didn't know were available to the public box, and out pops a functional PEM. Let's see what the power of this one kilowatt system can do. Wait, 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 wait. Before I show what it can do, I know some people are probably interested in how the rest of this works. Briefly put, it's literally just tubes and valves taking advantage of pressure, all sitting on top of a power supply. If we look under the bridge, you can see where the oxygen comes out. Here's the path that it goes. Here's where the hydrogen comes out. Again, this is the path that it follows. And you can also see where the water comes in. The water side and oxygen side are connected to the same reservoir because of what I said earlier about the anode needing the water on that side. The head pressure also prevents as much hydrogen from diffusing over, but it still can become a problem with these devices and reach the explosive limit if you run it for a long enough time. Now we have actually had this happen to us when trying to make the superconductor YBCO, where it just exploded. Along with hydrogen being able to diffuse over to the oxygen side, water can actually diffuse over to the hydrogen side through osmosis driven by electric field. This is why the hydrogen side also has the reservoir that you see, and it automatically feeds back into the oxygen reservoir in a nice closed system. Now, as I'm sure you've noticed, all of these valves, this device is very analog and is controlled entirely by these valves. Want pure oxygen? The valves. Pure hydrogen? The valves. HHO mix? You guessed it, the valves. Okay, okay, that's enough of explaining about the device. So as you hopefully know by now, we have two outputs. We got the oxygen output and the hydrogen output. The oxygen output outputs sweet, sweet oxygen. While the hydrogen output outputs a very flammable gas with a very low explosive limit. However, to get what we really want, we have to combine the streams. This is the power of burning unburnt, burnt water, which was previously unburnt before that. I want to start by trying to melt some copper coated aluminum wire. This was too easy for the torch. So easy that it even started burning. Copper was up next, which didn't end up burning, but it was nice to see it melt off the rod and drop into the water. Lastly, I wanted to try steel. Steel has a very high melting point and gives off beautiful showers of sparks as it melts and burns. Burning metals is great and all, but what about something more relevant, like pest control? Recently, I've been having hornets fly in through my air vents, They're in the vents. They're and my landlord doesn't They're seem to care too much. Fortunately, I think I've come up with a solution. Just have to do this, and then do this. Thank you everyone so much for watching. If you like the video and want to support us, find us on eBay or Etsy where we sell our Lichtenberg figures. We also now have a Patreon for people who want to support us through there.